I thought we would go ahead and look at um, just some tactics for fruit production and uh, some things that uh, you, you know that I actually hail over on the southern Maryland shore, uh, we can, you know, the western side of the bay, and uh, we have a, um, a, a good fruit team over there over the years, and we basically look at trying to transition at the farm out of tobacco, and so the fruit crops have been a big part of that, and so there's our fruit team up there. Uh, Herb's since retired, and I guess uh, Dr. Walsh, I hope he sticks around for a little bit while, but no, he's going to retire too. Okay, he's so he's retired. Gone. He's not gone. Okay, good. And the, um, but we've had a number of trials over there, peaches and apples, and uh, I did fire blight studies, and we had a vineyard project that went on for a number of years, uh, 16 years straight with 37 different vanilla varieties, so it was, that was really a great project. Blueberries, and we, in fact, this is our first trial. We've actually started another blueberry trial. And when it comes to herbicides for all these things, you know, <laughs> there's too many rights <laughs> that you have to, <laughs> that have to occur <laughs> uh, for good herbicide and good weed control. The right material, the right rate, the right timing, the right placement, and then the right weather. And uh, so, again, uh, we typically um, we have to have a lot to do to make sure that it all adds up uh, to a really good weed control. So I thought I would give you some, uh, some ideas on that. I put together this paper here. Um, actually, it's in your folder. And uh, what I like about this paper is that it, it kind of gives you an overview of most of the fruit. I won't say it's all of them, but it's, it's pretty close to an exhausted list for fruit. And it has the uh, burn down products up there, then the pre-emergent, and then some products that are pre-emergent and post, and then the post control products in that order as you go down. And also, I've got the, the um, HRAC uh, codes there, so you can look at the families. You see the different letters there, so you can actually start to see the groups there, the PPOs of the 14s. And, and uh, so we can start looking down that list. And of course, um, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of these herbicides today. Also some pretty important points on this paper that you don't, we won't find on the label. You have to go to the material safety data sheet, the safety data sheet, to find out things like K coefficient and water solubility and half-life in the soil. And that's average half-life. And so half-life can typically have quite a long range before the degradation pathway kicks in. But it's nice to know how long lived these products can be in the soil. And you can see it varies all over the place, right, as far as longevity in the soil. And so even though gramoxin can stay in the soil for a 1,000 days, that doesn't mean it's active. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, that's completely soil bound, as well as the Roundup. But you can see Roundup breaks down pretty quick. Uh, glufosinate, only seven days. And it's typically hard to find much more, uh, much of that product beyond that, uh, that window. So, Again, it is important to know, especially when we get into pre-emergence, how long we have activity, maybe when rotations and things like that. So, hey, hey, yes. Take a second. Yes. K coefficient. That's really important. That is a, a, a measure of the affinity to carbon of the soil. Um, and so they use that to express how likely it is to be bound to the soil colloids, as the clay, as well as the organic matter. And the higher the number, the more tightly it's bound. And so that's really important. You take a product like, um, where's a good one there, Prow, 17,000. Prow doesn't move very well in the soil. So I know that when I have high rainfall, Prow's a good one to have out there. Um, you know, it can stay put in that we need to, these pre-emergents need to be in a zone in the soil where we have germination. So pre-emergents, prior to the weed germination, we want a band of herbicides. So when they germinate in that band of herbicides, it can be active against that weed. And the problem is uh, we can get some of these products with a, a fairly high water solubility and a low K coefficient. They don't have that affin affinity to be bound to the soil. And they'll move. They'll move. That band will continue to move down. And uh, if that's the case, if it goes down below the, the weed zone of germination, you really have lost control. And so it's really important to understand K coefficient. So lower Very K, important. Lower K coefficient, the more, more, more likely it is to leach and move. That's right. And that's really where you find those numbers. That's not on the label, the safety data sheets, right? That's where you find those numbers. That's why it's so important uh, to pay attention to those things. And they can describe how they're going to react when you get six inches of rain or when you don't get any rain. <laughs> you know, you can, you can have completely different. Then you wouldn't want the prow. You'd want something that actually moved a little bit when you had, when you had less frequently, frequent rainfall. The, um, of course, uh, another really good source out there, Weed Science Society of, of America has the the handbook, the herbicide uh, handbook, comes out about every five years. And they're really, if you really want to dig deep into herbicide science, physiology, and uh, chemistry of those, uh, those products, that's the book you go to. So that's a great, that's a great book. Um, CDMS.net, everyone should have this bookmarked on their cell phone or the computer because that's how you can get the labels and safety data sheets, right? 
cdms.net. You can put in the, in this case, I searched for Prowl, and up comes Prowl, and you can pull out the label there, and notice it's got a label for orchards, or vineyards. <clears throat> the, um, I also, in the handout, the folder, I put there my yearly update of my multi-tree fruit and multi um, small fruit, tree fruit guide. So I hope you still find those useful. I do them as much for my benefit as anyone's. And it, it, sometimes it, you, get, you scratch your head when you get into the chem room. Uh, what am I going to do today? <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> you have a little better plan, but you're watching the weather. And sometimes you do need to make, be a little more flexible about what you're, what you're planning to do. So hopefully uh, these sheets do help you out a little bit. You'll notice that I have a section on that sheet for herbicides. Um, and again, I have the resistant action codes there for that. And I always put my little notes in there when I typically like that's again to remind me. I hope it helps you. Should this one go in the fall? Should it go in the spring? Is it dormant? Is it? And I have a lot of those notes on that other spray sheet too. So I just want to uh, hope you find any. I'll take any comments on these sheets. <laughs> yeah, it won't hurt my feelings. Send them my way. What you'd like to see, what you think I ought to maybe edit. That's fine too. Um, you also notice I put a substitution chart in there for uh, some of the organic. Um, um, organic certified uh, products, OMRI approved. And so Axe, Scythe, Burnout, Avenger. How many of you have used any of them? They're, they're the burn down products and I would add them right to the top of that previous conventional list right there with the burn down. So the Gramoxone, the Glufosinate, and, the, and Avenger, you know, a couple applications of Avenger to succulent weeds that are less than three inches, you're gonna get good control on annuals. So again, they are pretty good. Burnout's very good, Axe is very good, the pelargonic acid, and um, Scythe is a pelargonic acid formulation too. And so Scythe does not have an OMRI label, which I don't understand, but Axe does. But they're both pelargonic acids. And that, in a pelargonic acid takes a lot of quantity. So we're talking about to get to the percent spray solution that you need, you're talking, you know, barrels of this stuff per acre. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, and that, but it will do the job. And the problem is, is these concentrated pelargonic acids can really be, uh, you notice what it says on there, warning, you know. So if you know your LD50 value ranges or your, what we have, we have danger, right? And that's LD50 value of 50 or less. And then you have the warning, or, which is 50 to 500, and then you have caution. You notice that this pelargonic acid is in the warning category. So it's kind of in that, in that range. Uh, most herbicides are actually in the caution. So, so again, the, um, uh, it, you have to be careful with these products too, even though they're organically approved. I really like them when we get into some of these kind of interior environments and high tunnels and greenhouses. If you're going to put stuff on the floor, you don't want to put stinger in that thing. You put stinger in there, stingers can last three years out in the, in the regular environment. You put it inside of a high tunnel, and you probably won't grow, be able to grow a tomato in there for 10 years. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so don't make that mistake. You might have to find out you're going to move your high tunnel if you put stinger in there. You're going to really limit. So that's why I like the, uh, sometimes the burn down products and even maybe some of the organic approach products in some of these high tunnels. I don't have to worry about the amount of it that might stay in the soil. Germoxin is kind of like the chemical um, disc. It kills everything on the surface. It pretty much kills every plant tissue. There is no resistance development to germoxin. And uh, it also is the only one that has the danger with the skull and crossbones on it. And that's why it is quite toxic. So that's a certified use, restricted use product only, but it's still a very good product. And you can use it safely. And so, and now with Gramoxin, I'll, I'll show you a few minutes. You can see how quickly it works. Here's um, a little renovation, putting in a, a apple block, till pulled out the peach trees, worked it up, and then uh, came back two weeks later. You can notice it goes from the green grass in the center and, and nice and dying in the, in the row. Come back another two weeks and it looks pretty nice, a nice transformation, right? And then, so again, Gramoxin is part of that burn down that, that works really well in a system like that. Uh, Gramoxin um, will have, in t September of 2020, a new closed system requirement. So we're gonna see big changes in the use of Gramoxin. I, they have said that when this comes out in closed containers, um, systems, that it will be, there will be some attachments that you can even put on the smallest sprayer. So whether you're using a big field rig or whether you're using a backpack, there'll be like a coupling that comes along with the product that allows you to meter directly from the container. No more will you be able to take your moxin jug and pour it into something and transfer it to the sprayer, right? It's a completely closed system. And that's how they're gonna get away from unfortunate deaths that occur from germoxin, where people put it typically in an unmarked container and then it only takes a sip. And typically the ones that do that are the six year old and unders. So we gotta stop that. And we can't seem to do it um, by following directions. 
So they're going to make sure with a closed system we have a better chance of following directions. The um, other thing about uh, gramoxin is that it's a heavy molecular weight chemistry. And so it actually um, does not volatilize, or not very easily, not within temperatures ranges that we would apply it. And so this heavy molecular weight, they actually put a stench agent in it. The stench agent volatilizes. So when you smell a, a gramoxin application, you really aren't smelling that heavy molecular weight, okay, the paraquat. You're smelling the stench agent. And, um, and so with that in mind, you really don't have to have an organic respirator. All you have to have is the N95, the NIOSH approved, basically dust mask is all you need because you're only going to breathe this in if you breathe it at all would be in a mist form, actually spray, spray material off the boom. Because once it hits the ground in the target, heavy molecular weight quickly binds. It binds to uh, vegetation tissue, it binds to soil. Uh, there's no off gassing, there's no off movement of that. So you, in order to get gramoxin after that, you'd have to eat the vegetation or the soil. Uh, essentially to get that. So from that standpoint, at least from the applications made, it's fairly, a fairly safe product. But during the application, the mist is something we want to avoid, and then the N95, we don't have to have a charcoal respirator to do that. There is going to be those that use gramoxin now. It's actually in, in, in effect right now. You have to have a gramoxin use certificate. How many of you have done that? Okay, very good. Everyone should be doing that now. And uh, you go to e-extension to do that. There are some extension agent offices around the country now that are starting to do this at the office. We're debating that right now as to what we're going to do with that. But e-extension works pretty well. There's, I went there and took the, they, they, they teach you about what's required in respirator, personal protective equipment. And then there's my certificate. So you get a, that's good for three years, hang it on the wall, and you can spray gramoxin, right? So make sure you do that. And... Uh, so the burn, other burn down chemical that's really important is glyphosate, Roundup, and of course I put on there uh, shielded spray only. I really do think we really need to pay attention to that, avoid trunk, branch, and bud contact with uh, this systemic product, fully systemic product, uh, um, uh, Roundup. It is a good one to go out. Here's just an example of just Roundup and a little bit of Devernol, putting in some beach plums. Nice way to just come right out there in that sod and start them off. And they have the little beach plums there getting started. They do pretty well too. There's Ben harvesting them a few, year, a few years later. Anyone grow beach plums? They're kind of an interesting plant. I think we could do more with them. They really are a preserved type plant. You're not going to fresh sell. There, there's no flavor <laughs> macarena to these things really. <clears throat> Unless you put a lot of sugar in them and put them in a jar. The, um, and I do like my peaches better than heavy syrup in a can. <laughs> so, because they're much more consistent. <laughs> Here's something that's really interesting. Uh, final ruling, or final, just came out just a month ago. And what does it say? It says EPA finalizes glyphosate mitigation, okay? Kind of like case closed. That's what they're saying here. <laughs> See what they say? It says EPA has concluded that there are no risk of concern to human health when glyphosate is used according to the label and that it is not a carcinogen. I don't know how it can get any stronger than that, right? And if you look on the safety data sheet, what does it say about both the glyphosate molecule as well as the surfactant technology, both of them say um, non-toxic. Now, I don't think you get any stronger than that either. So I think, you know, this, the science has been here for a long time, and not only did the U.S. come to that conclusion, look at all those other departments around the world that have come to that same conclusion, right? I wish some of this message would get out in the mainstream and we would start talking science uh, instead of hysteria. But that's where we are with glyphosate. Glyphosinate um, is our product like Rely. And the, you'll think of Liberty Link and, and some of the other products. And this one here is a very interesting uh, product. And uh, also, avoid fruit, branch, trunk, and bud contact. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one that I've used in the vineyards. I like mixing, rely with the PPO products, like, uh, like the Venue or the AIM. Um, and they really are nice directed sprays. You're not going to spray them right onto your, 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 especially your soft green tissue. Uh, one thing that has came, come about about rely is, Recently, um, fairly recently, a strong warning came out from Brad Majek. Now, I respect Brad Majek, so when he comes out with a strong warning about this product, I'm going to pay attention. And he saw cambium layer death um, to mature trees, essentially sloppy spraying with rely, and soaking the trunks down, and guess what? Killed the cambium layer of the tree. You killed the cambium layer, you've girdled the tree, right? So you're game over. <laughs> And so when Brad came out with that, I thought, whoa, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, well, to pay you a lot more attention. Now, I have never seen that. Yes, Tom? Is there any danger with gramoxone doing the same thing? Gramoxone on really green tissue can. 
You know, so, uh, not a well, I, I'll tell you what, I think everything should be directed away from the trunk. And I really do think, I'll show you what I recommend here. I really think that we should be doing more latex painting, a heavy latex layers around that, that spray zone. Um, so we don't get likelihood of that going below the bark layer. Um, and so that's, and I think with Rely, I talked to Wayne Mitchum down in North Carolina about this glufosinate issue, this Rely. This, you know, what, what about Brad Majak's warning, you know? I'll get to you in a minute, Bill. And um, in North Carolina, uh, I was talking to Wayne. I said, what have you seen, Wayne? Well, you know, here's what I've seen. I've used Rely around the trees, and, and I've used Gramoxin around the trees, and I really don't use Roundup around the trees. I've, I've seen too much damage with that. And so, and, but I'll have to admit, I always really heavily latex whitewashed my trees, right? And I talked to, I talked to uh, Wayne Mitchum about that, and he, he agreed. He said, we do quite a bit of that, too. He recommended, and if we talked together, we kind of, kind of came up with the same recommendations. Wait till the second year. And also have them heavily latexed. And uh, um, we, neither one of us like growth tubes, but cartons might be okay. Um, but we like, thought the idea of grafting tape might be, if we really have tender tree trunks, and we know we're going to be sloppy, latex paint and maybe some grafting tape around the trunk might not be a bad idea. And that's kind of, I think that's kind of paying hom heed and homage to what Brad, Brad Majek uh, saw. And so I'm, I'm going to say with Gramoxin and with Rely, and certainly with Roundup, <laughs> you know, Roundup is one I say, man, you get that on the trunk of the tree, you're just flirting with disaster. But these other two, there, there could be disaster potential. And so that's why latex wrapping, wait until they're well established one year. Um, always add ammonium sulfate to both glyphosate and to glufosinate, both those chemicals. And um, it, you can also mix other herbicides with this, this glufosinate, too, as long as it's off, you know, you're not spraying this with this kind of protection in place. So anyway, Bill, do you have a comment? I, I have killed some big old delicious with six, eight-inch trunks. Uh, and I would have to say that the whole thing is Roundup. Roundup, absolutely. No doubt in my mind. But glufosinate, I was always thinking that that was safer, but now I'm kind of rethinking that a little bit. We need some protection there in place. And the idea of shielded and directed and maybe some tree protection is not a bad idea. Okay, that's kind of where I'm, I'm thinking right now. The, um, and and um, so making herbicides work. Let's think about that a little bit. Let me see my time here. Wait a, oh, my, it's just about going, isn't it? So we're not going to do too much of this. I know we talked about this last time. Um, but, you know, pay attention to what's needed to be added to these products. Keep in mind the rain fast. I also, that's a very important uh, part, part of paying to attention. So what's needed? Do you need an, to add an, uh, um, uh, a crop oil concentrate or ammonium sulfate or, or a seed oil? Or do you need, what about rain fastest? How long is it going to be rain fast out there? That's really important, too, um, to pay attention to. And it takes six to eight hours, you know, so that's, that's a long time. You know, knowing, so knowing those PPOs might take a little more time is important. Also, mixing. Tank mixing is very important. And so know the order. And when you get an order of a tank mixture, Maybe write it down, make some notes, make sure, make sure it's going to work out for you. And nothing worse than an unsprayable mixture. And there's this acronym, WAM legs. It used to be called whales, but they added a few extra things in there. We come up with things like microencapsulation and things like that. And glyphosate's the G. Um, also, a lot to do with water chemistry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that right now because I want to real quickly get just a couple of herbicides in before my time is up. And uh, the... Uh, um, a pH is very critical. Most of our herbicides are weak acids. And so with weak acids, we want to have our water on the slightly acidic side. So make sure, that's, make sure you keep that in mind, too. You don't want alkaline water most of the time. That's an antagonist, typically, to the activity of most of our herbicides. The um, Roundup needs to have ammonium sulfate in it. Don't forget that. And turbidity and K KOC has a lot to turbidity is soil in the water, so we need clean water. Uh, so that, that also can be a binding factor. And uh, with, um, with the um, glyphosate, you can do a jar test to find out if you have hard water. Hard water means you have calcium, iron, sodium, magnesium, uh, the free cations, right? And so that reacts with the, ammonium, uh, with the glyphosate, and it makes the, actually the molecule becomes inert. <coughs> Even though it can be transported into the plant, it's no longer a herbicide. However, if ammonia is sitting on there from ammonium sulfate, it's actually a little bit more active of a, of a glyphosate molecule. And it still transfers right through into the plant. So ammonium sulfate counteracts hard water. And there's actually a formula and a calculation so you can have your water tested, find out what the parts per million is, and then figure out exactly how much ammonium sulfate you need for your water, okay, by calculation. So 
just some really unique things that you can do to make these chemicals work. You know, and that's kind of the kind of that all those getting all those rights. You know, is is doing the things to th understand the chemistry a part of it. The um, chemistry in the soil and how it interacts with microbial act actions, predisposition. We don't want to spray the same products because the microbes get hungry and wait for it. So if you keep using uh, Princep or you keep using Devernol, you'll you'll have a basically a hungry microbe population that can actually break them things down much quicker. The degradation pathway will be enhanced. So predisposition is continuing to spray the same product. So mix them up. That's a really important thing to remember. And uh, let's see. Um, well, weather, warm, of course, we know that um, we want products to break down in a certain time period. But when we do get rain, excessive rainfall and warm weather, they tend to break down quicker. So, we, you know, I always think that it's, it's minimum of three herbicide applications to keep an orchard clean. More than likely, it's five a year. Uh, to do it to do it justice, you know. So again, it's it's this constant um, staying ahead of the game. Here's just a couple quick slides on the tree fruit herbicides, and they have a list there. I'll have all these slides online if you want to get back to them sometime. And uh, so again, I just put that one up there for trees. So this gives you an idea. We've used to be that we had maybe five or six herbicides. We're getting a pretty good list now of products. I can remember when I first started fruit, and you may have five herbicides, you know. <laughs> Now we got maybe two dozen, you know, that we can really do a good job with. And uh, post weed control, also um, pre-emergence uh, pre and post weed control, that's your brambles and blueberries. That list has really exploded, you know, and so we've got a lot to learn there. Maybe some new ones in there to play with. Yeah. Talking about Zeus and, and Carfentrazon, I haven't added Zeus to that list yet. Ames on there. Zeus is a formulation of Carfentrazon and sulf uh, Sulfentrazon, which is the old Spartan formulation. So we're getting new products. They're coming into the marketplace. Um, here's your strawberry herbicides with some notes on those. The, um, real quickly, just your pre-emergence products. Um, pay attention to the length of time that the um, orchards have to be established. And also think about pre-harvest intervals and things like prowl. And uh, here we are putting some blueberries out. I just want to show you a real nice visual. This is blueberry planting at Upper Marlboro. And um, you'll notice that this is, uh, this is just Devernol. And Gramoxin sprayed over top of that, okay? Did a nice time of detail between the blueberry plants after they were set out. Look at the, the rows that we had already that basically didn't get that one treatment. Isn't that amazing? Just that little bit of Devernol. And there's a couple rows we worked up that we didn't plant, right? And so that just shows you herbicides work. I love that because, you know, there's nothing better, I think, more satisfying to see pictures where you get that kind of activity. Here's uh, raspberries, same thing, Devernol, Gramoxin. Just a little bit of, and it would look just as bad as that grass that you saw over in that blueberry field. So, again, we know these pre-emergence products do work. Get them in that soil zone. Use a little bit of burn down product to kill the existing vegetation. Of course, you get in later on, you get into mulching and sawdust and all those kind of things. It gets hopefully a little easier for you, especially when you get into some bigger bushes. There's old O'Neill. Um, I think I'm probably close on time now. We got a couple minutes or a couple minutes. A couple minutes. Um, I was out in Napa Valley, and I actually got this picture. This is Robert Madavi's vineyard. He's passed on now, but he's got a beautiful f farm there. And they were actually in there. I looked across the field, and they were tilling. Uh, see if I can catch the fella. And back over in that corner, he has a tiller, and he was doing tillage. My guess is he probably might have been putting a Casseron application down. Good weed control with tillage, you know, so that's something that I was thinking about Casseron when he, was, when he did that. I didn't go down and run out and find out what he was doing. But tillage and herbicides together sometimes can be effective um, if you have a non-erodible site. Um, they also, again, some of these, um, the diurons, the substituted ureas, photosynthetic inhibitors, uh, very good to mix in there, those Carmexes and diurons and uh, Sinbar into those older fruit plantings. Devernol is the one I always start out with. It's the safest on fruit, so you're less likely to hurt yourself with Devernol. Um, Curb, on the other hand, same, same family, acid amides. Um, same family as dual, if you're, if you're familiar with agronomic herbicides. Very, uh, very good herbicides to have in the program. Devernol to start out fruit, Curb when it gets older. Curb's nice in the fall. I like Curb in the fall. Uh, here's an application of, um, in the spring of Princep on a uh, Nomron. That's Devernol and, um, and uh, Gramoxin at bud break. Princep's one that I like too because the Simazine Princep has... Um, uh, really good, good activity on those big seeded broadleaves. So that's why you need a trizine. 
And so I like the, the simazine in there. Again, three years you need to have, and use only during the dormant period. Uh, really great in peaches. So here's a simazine application uh, prior to bloom in peaches. Real nice application in there at the spring. And I think I'll, I'll just skip that from now, Mike. I think oh, I've got to get to the end slide here because I know I'm out of time. And anyway, make sure you get to Veg News. And uh, we'll, we'll start that in April, and we'll get that information out to you. And I'm actually starting on my um, website some new things I want to share with you. I've got Ag Tech um, slide shows up there. I've got 20 slide presentations up there right now uh, that are pretty up to date. And I'm hoping to do YouTubes on all of them. So that's my new YouTube channel that's coming up. So anyway, it'll be something maybe get a refresher on some of these things over time. And, and uh, I got this new Ag Tech time you want, you want to sign up and sign up for the newsletter. So a lot going on in Extension. Pretty proud of uh, our group uh, you know, around the state as we work together help you solve some of these problems out there. So I think I'll call it a day there. Mike. <laughs>